November 19th, 2009. You're listening to The Infidel Guy Show. Is the Infidel Guy Show once again? Hi, I'm your host Reginald Finley, and I'm your co-host Val. Thanks for tuning in tonight. We have with us standing by on the line Edward Winston, who's going to be talking to us tonight about Zeitgeist. Many of you are familiar with the internet sensation. That has rocked the free thought world called Zeitgeist, but believe me, it really has become something like a cult phenomenon. I've a number of believers have contacted me over the years, uh-huh. over the past two years or so, saying, "Have you seen this movie? It's totally blowing away, opening up my mind." And I love to say, "Well, yeah, you know, it's a great primer for those who are unfamiliar with different ideas about religion." But uh, I'd be very careful about taking it all as gospel. And some people find that surprising that I'd even you know, say something like that. They're like, why wow. would you? Yeah, it's like, shouldn't you agree with uh, what the video says? Don't you agree with it? And it's like, uh, no, I don't really agree with everything that's in the uh, film. So speaking of which, our guest tonight, although I doubt this person has very sci- much scientific data that tried to attack me, but Edward, mm-hmm. Edward Winston is our guest tonight from Conspiracy Science. You can check out his website at conspiracyscience.com. Com. Yes, very good website. Yes. He's on today to discuss his critique of the film Zeitgeist. And he talks about other things as well at his website yes. that you might want to He'll tell us a little bit more about. Uh, welcome to the program, Edward Winston. Hey, how you doing? Hi, glad to have you on board with us tonight. Tell us first about how you decided to come up with this website, Conspiracy Science, and maybe some of your background. Well, um, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Pick up there, okay. Years ago, a friend of mine who is also an atheist, I'm an atheist, should bring that out right now. Okay. (laughs) Uh, he, he, Sent me the a link to the movie when it very it was only about a month after it came out okay. on the internet, and he said you should check this out. Uh, part one of the movie is great. You know, it's pretty much seals the deal for you know proving that atheism is the only way. <laughs> I was like, well, I got to see this. <laughs> uh-huh. I did. And then right off the bat, I realized that a lot of things were factually wrong with what they were talking about. Mm-hmm. And. I was just pointing out to him on the internet, like, you know, this is wrong, you know, this is wrong. This is the 9-11 stuff. I'm like, what the hell is this? Right, and right. And, 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 and the arguments... Regular... Yeah, and, and the arguments are just silly, aren't they? I mean, it's, it's, it's like the same kind of critical thinking they use to analyze many religious claims, they don't apply some of those same standards to some of the more, you know, historical claims that, you know, that, that give them support, alleged so here's the historical support for what they claim. It's amazing. Yeah, and then what happened was he has a friend of mine. His name is Eric. He sent me several other people to talk to me because they liked the movie too. And he wanted, you know, that he was like, you know, tell them what you told me about it. And eventually, I just said, you know, I'm just going to make a file, like an HTML file, with all the information on it. And then I got some, a lot of requests for it, and some emails about it. Mm-hmm. But I thought I'm going to put up the internet. And instead of getting something like, you know, that guy is wrong dot com, I decided to get something a little bit more broad in case I wanted to debunk other stuff in the future. <laughs> right. Because mm-hmm. at this point I was I was never a debunker. I mean, I was always skeptical. And growing up I was raised in an atheist family. My parents are both atheists. Oh man, you're lucky. So I was always <laughs> I was given a kind of uh, you know, skeptical view of the world from the very beginning. Nice. And so I never felt the need to go out and debunk anything. And I always liked conspiracies. I mean, they're just really fascinating to me. So I had known about Alex Jones, and I I had seen all of his movies up to that point. I never, you know, debunked them or argued with anybody about them. Mm-hmm. I was like, you know, 
when I went to go look out, look for information about these movies, I, I found out for the most part there was absolutely nothing from the opposing side. Absolutely nothing. I was like, hmm. hell, I'll do it. Nothing else to do for the most part. So that's what I did, and that's how I started the site. Oh. Hmm. So, well, now I'm, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. And now I'm trying to expand into not just conspiracies, but, you know, regular misconceptions. Like, I just got, like, a whole VA side of uh, article up. And misconceptions and regular myths, you know, myths that uh, Snopes won't cover. Like, Snopes probably will never talk about uh, accusations that Barack Obama, you know, is a fucking homosexual. Uh, but, you know, uh, those, those are things <laughs> I will talk about because I don't really worry about not being friendly. I try to be family-friendly, but, you know, mm-hmm. I, I'll push the limit a little bit. The PG-13, I guess. Right. Okay. Huh. And, well, <laughs> how do you think a skeptic should approach these popular conspiracy theories? And one problem is, I think, is that the, is that the identification of them just may be the problem. I mean, I can see how someone would say, something sounds, it sounds real to me. This could be possible. Um, you know, and they end up falling for the information. I mean, how do you go about evaluating some of these conspiracy theories and knowing, separating fact from fiction and not get as intimately involved as some of my listeners obviously have, especially with like 911 conspiracies conspiracies and stuff like that? How should we approach it? Yeah. Like I said, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't an experienced bunker when I started the website, so I had to kind of, you know, come up with my own way of doing things. And what I realized right away is if I find out where the conspiracy came from mm-hmm. and who came up with it or what group came up with it, mm-hmm. any agenda they may have and the original evidence they come up, you know, came up with and then work from there, I can often figure out, you know, what they've gotten wrong about different things and why they added on different, you know, different groups added on different things. Of course, oh. it doesn't work with everything, but it works with a lot of, like, for example, the North American Union conspiracy theory, you know, I go back, where did North American Union come from? Well, it's from a book by Robert A. Pastor in 2002, and before that, there's never a mention by any conspiracy theorist of North American Union, nor Amero. He mentions it in the book, you know, a couple years later, Alex Jones gets a hold of it, he says, this is absolute fact, even though it was just a suggestion, Mm. you know, he's not even even a politician. I think he is now, but I don't think he was then. Um, and say, well, this is proof it's going to happen. This is what their plan is. And that's what they do with everything. They take, like, a blog post or a news, an op-ed piece from the news, and they say, this is fact. This is what's going to happen. And in as long as it fits their agenda, you know, for example, they'll say, well, you know, you can't trust the news, but watch this clip from MSNBC. <laughs> well, trust the news and they the news, whether or not it validates the conspiracy theory or not. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's <laughs> usually the route. Is just looking at where these things come from, and you know, if you do that, you tend to find out exactly why they have an agenda for it, and that why while people, you know, going out on Facebook or whatever talking about the conspiracies may have, you know, you know, good intentions in mind to you know notify people of what's really going on, but the people who started these things usually have money or political gain or fame involved with making these things up or imagining it, whether or not they realize them. Right. Hmm. Well, let's talk about some of these things then. Um, you know, <laughs> what, well, let's go, let's, let's go into the zeitgeist. guys. That's one of the primary reasons where we're here tonight. Um, first of all, talk to us, what is this zeitgeist movement? Is, is there such a thing, first of all? And if so, you know, what is that? Uh, the Zeitgeist Movement is a group started by the same person who created the film, Peter Joseph, is what his pen name is. And he created the group as a way to express the ideas that were put out in the second movie and in the third film, which is available on you know, the ZeitgeistMovement.com. Oh, okay. And um, it basically, it's a way to help promote not only the movies as well, but also the concepts behind a unrelated project called the Venus Project, which is a hmm. kind of a, a pseudo-utopian mm-hmm. uh, artistic dream kind of thing. I mean, they don't really have any kind of 
specific ideals or accomplishments laid out, and I think that's what the Zeitgeist Movement try, is trying to do, is trying to set these things up and have a, a plan and how to establish uh, the Venus Project. Wow, okay. Um, now, Zeitgeist is composed of a number of parts to it. Uh, I believe part one talks about the origins of Christianity, part two talks about 9-11 truth, and part three talks about the federal government and the banking systems. Yeah, the banking system and things like that. Um, but let's let's first talk about the origin of Christianity. Now, a lot of this stuff sounds pretty good to one who is really looking for that. You know that what's what that term looking for? That one um, single thing that just knocks Christianity out of the box. You know, it sounds like this <laughs> this has got to be it. Uh, what do you, what is the primary argument that? the zeitgeist is using about uh, the origin of Christianity? It, it's essentially that Christianity took uh, the various rituals and beliefs from and from other religions, mm-hmm. namely Egyptian, uh, Greek, and a few other, like Roman and a few other things. Right, which, could, which could be possible, yeah. Which, you know, uh, and you know, I can get into that in a second, which which is true, they do take, they, well, they did take, from other religions. The problem is, instead of pointing out the actual religions they took through, from, such as the Babylonian uh, set of religions, or the uh, uh, Zoroastrianism, right. those two primarial things, mm-hmm. instead of pointing out those, they talk about completely unrelated things. Right. I mean, if you talk about Zoroastrianism and the Babylonian faith, where, you know, you have essentially, you know, mono, the rise of monotheism and, uh, you know, the two roles of, you know, good versus evil, right. of, you know, having a both. And, you know, with Babylonians, you had, you know, the Great Flood, you had angels, these kind of things. And, mm-hmm. and if you take these things with them together, it's obvious where, you know, Judaism got them from. And how, and you can you can take how, Christ, you can find out how Christianity kind of changed and dropped some things. Mm. And it's not it's, it's not that hard to figure out where this stuff comes from. I mean, it's it's anyone who really wants to look into it. I mean, a lot mm-hmm. of it's right there in the Bible. I mean, I've read the Bible three times in my life, uh, and it's all three times. You know, you start to realize everything from the first part. You know, the Old Testament becomes uh, you know kind of like a buffet of what they want to take out, and they put it into the second part, and they add in some stuff from this guy Jesus. And that's basically what it is. And instead of pointing out things like that and what's actually wrong with Christianity, they talk about, you know, Horus being the sun god, which he wasn't. He was the god of the sky. Right. And they bring up... <laughs> this, this that's right. Ra right. was the sun god. This massive list of popular things that are popular of every religion, you know, like raising from the dead. Wow, that's something no one would want to do. You know, <laughs> that's something everyone... And in especially ancient people who had no concept of medicine or anything or why life is what is life. So you know it's common and popular to believe that the sun is you know maybe the sun did create us or maybe the sun is a powerful god because it you know, brings us daylight and brings us light. Mm-hmm. But that time that doesn't mean Christianity had to steal these things. They didn't. Christianity didn't have to steal from anyone. I mean it had its own. Uh, history set up with Judaism, who did take from earlier surrounding. Exactly, you're a very good point, um, Edward. I'm glad you brought that up. Right, I've argued that for for a long time as well. It's like, as they say, one protests too much. There's so, as you mentioned, such a buffet of other things to choose from. Why would they need to just go to Egyptians? And and you're right. And then if one even studies it a little bit, just to study Christianity just as a small bit, uh, they begin to see right away the similarities with many other cultures in the surrounding region and not just Egypt, but um, you see the stories being told, um, you know, over and over again. And uh, that's one thing I did see wrong with that as well. I think it also gave an allusion to Kersey Graves' work, I believe. Uh, I believe uh, the work was called 16 Crucified Saviors. And I believe it makes some references to that in, in some of the gods that the video mentions. Does that sound familiar to you? It mentions uh, not just Horace, but it mentions quite a number of other comparisons. Oh yeah, they did. What's the, what was what was the title you said? I believe it was uh, the the world's sixteen crucified saviors. I uh, no, I don't think I believe I read that. Oh, okay, 
but but that's where a lot of this comes from actually that 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 piece of work and a lot of the there are a lot of stretches in the works the uh well zeitgeist primarily you know the primary sources for part one are dia murdoch who is also you know atari s right the same person and also you know she takes from you know gerald macy or massey gerald massey and Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, they use him as a source. So all three sources pretty much go all the way back to Gerald Matt for things that, you know, Acharya has come up with. And it's pretty clear to me she has some kind of bizarre agenda against Christianity. And I don't know what it would be or why. I mean, of course, it's popular to hate Christianity. When I was a teenager, you know, being an atheist, I was pretty pretty mean to Christians and things like that. But, Hmm. you know, it's something you grow out of. But I don't think she did grow out of it. And... Well, it's funny. It's funny. There, there's some background to that, but I don't. <laughs> but she's not here to get, get to defend herself and get into that right now tonight. But there is guess, funny enough. There is some, comes, some background to that. Go wait, ahead. Like I said. Yeah, well, yeah, but it's not really relevant to the discussion. I'm just saying. But um, what? Ha- what? Oh man, I lost some train of thought. But, sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 sorry. Hang, hanging around with me—that's going to happen a lot. I apologize for that. But uh, but yeah, you were talking about his sources basically and the motivation for probably getting well, in, uh, in his sources. Yeah. Well, like I said earlier, I mean, I go back and I try to figure out where these things came from, and I I read a lot on her site and a lot of the things she wrote. And what was striking to me is she made all kinds of claims about her education and things like that, you know, and that doesn't really what concerns me. But the fact that she says that she's fluent in Greek and Hebrew, yet makes the claim that God's son equals God's son, S-O-N. Uh, when, when we know etymologically, that's not quite right, right? It's absolutely impossible, especially in Greek and Hebrew, especially Hebrew. Right. And they sound similar in English and other Germanic languages, and a little bit of and Slavic languages, but for the that's most part, true. outside of Indo-European languages, they do not sound the same that's at all, good. and they have no linguistic similarity. That's a good point because the Greek is hel- is Helios, and then and the Hebrew is like Shamash, Shamash, or an even uh, Akkadian. It's sh- it's Shamash, and um, yeah, that, that's interesting. Huh? I didn't put the I didn't think about that. But okay, that to me, yeah, you know that knows that you know if she and even today she still promotes that. Yes, and I just and it says something's wrong with her. At least the foundations of what she's you know her discoveries. And she'll, you know, use Gerald, was it Massey, he said? Yep, Gerald Massey. Mm-hmm. As a secondary source, and almost never uses primary sources. But when she does, like, for example, she references, you know, essentially the story of heaven and hell from Christianity as being played out in the Book of the Dead, and references where, it, where it's at in the Book of the Dead, and it's nowhere in the Book of the Dead. Mm. Egyptian Book of the Dead, things like that. Oh, and that's it's, a shame. where she's coming up with? And I'm not necessarily saying she's lying. Maybe she's embellishing, or maybe she's getting her sources directly from, you know, Gerald Mathen. and he was lying. But there's definitely something wrong with it. And, it. and when it comes down to it, like I said, I mean, it's not hard to, you know, debunk something like Christianity if you really want to. Right. You don't need to actually lie about it, and you don't need mm-hmm. to make things up, and you don't need to, you know, claim that Christianity stole from both Buddhism and Egyptians. I mean, come on. Uh, you don't. I mean, I'm willing to say, yeah, they took a lot of things from the previous Roman faith when it came mm-hmm. to Rome. Obviously, I mean, but <laughs> they didn't need to take all these other aspects of. You can't say, well, this religion has, you know, you know, recurring life and death, so therefore, you know, it must be yes. taken from them. Good or point. you know, saying that these other gods were crucified when they were never crucified. And then they're claiming, well, the cross represents, you know, the cross of the Zodiac. Well, no, the cross represents the fact that Jesus was crucified on a cross. That's why Christians use it. They don't use it to represent the Zodiac. I mean, if Jesus was, you know, beaten to death, he would have, you know, maybe it would be a club. It wouldn't be a cross. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. there's nothing to do with the Zodiac. It's just easy to make these connections in order to try to prove something to people. They look at proof that Christianity is wrong. Well, you can do that without a whole lot of effort. You don't need to lie, is what I'm saying. Well, that's, that's intriguing, yeah. Um, and not to mention, there are so many other instances in which I guess we could use the Zodiac actually as some argument 
Um, it, it is it is true. We all know that the ancients did know, or the biblical writers knew about the Mazaloth, or the Muzaloth, the Pingapon, but they knew about it. They knew, they knew about the, Zod- the zodiac. So, um, but yeah, but saying whether or not that is a that that represents the the cross of crucifixion, you know, yeah, I'm not too sure. I, I would have to find evidence of earlier crosses before crucifixion was something that was being being uh, conducted, and then well, can- we'd have something to work off on. There's evidence of crosses being used all the way back, you know, to the Neolithic era for you know a variety of reasons. It all depends on what the local population believed it to represent, you know. Right. And it was used as a representation of you know two cross sticks, usually maybe in an X form. Actually, would be used to represent the mark of someone who was buried, you know, thousands of years ago. Right. right. In Europe, I um, mean, mm-hmm. these are different things, and and also I would be willing to say, you know. But, you know, people ask me if I think Jesus ever existed. And I say, you know, I would be willing to, you know, surrender that maybe he did. Right. But I really doubt it. That's what I say. I mean, I really, really doubt it. At least not the person who was mapped out in the New Testament. Right. And that person that's, that's the same thing I say. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, I say the same thing. Uh, also, quickly, another cross is um, the, the Ankh, a form of cross with a circle mm-hmm. on top, which is a symbol of uh, fertility and eternal life, because fertility equals eternal life in some respects. So. But yeah, um, so I mean, and again, at the same time, but you're not saying it couldn't. It couldn't. You're not. You're not excluding the idea that it could could have possibly been an amalgam of different ideas that managed to perpetuate these kinds of symbolisms and beliefs, by stating that they were just one source and it's stolen. That's a bit of a stretch, correct? Yeah, it, I, I like I said, I would definitely be willing to you know say yeah, it's stolen. I mean, obviously it is. Every concept pretty much is stolen from or, or borrowed, and, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> borrowed. Yeah, yeah, because they don't realize it. But they don't. As, I don't think they know they're stealing it. But yes, yeah. As as per the evidence laid out, you know, in Zeitgeist, it's simply, as far as I can tell, not true. And I don't really have a reason not to believe it. I mean, it doesn't bother me either way because either way, it's you know, Christianity is still bullshit. I mean, <laughs> sorry, for, but bull stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, true. So that doesn't make a difference to me. So that's why sometimes, though, I get I get a lot of hate mail. I'm sure you do too, but I get a lot of hate mail from Zeitgeist fans and other people as well. And I get accused of being a closet Christian a lot. Mm-hmm. And I say I don't really give a damn if you accuse me or not. I'm not. I don't care. Mm-hmm. I mean, if something's wrong, it's wrong. It doesn't matter who you know what the person says or the person saying it believes. If it's true, it's true. If it's wrong, it's wrong. And so far, the evidence presented by Zeitgeist is wrong. I looked it up, you know, myself, I have all the sources, and people do contact me, and, you know, they tell me I'm wrong, and a lot of, most of the time they don't tell me where I'm wrong, they just say that I am. Mm-hmm. And I tell mm-hmm. them, I, I email them back, or message them back on Facebook, and I say, you know, point out something specific. Most of the time I don't get a message back. Sometimes people do point out specific things, and we talk about it, or if I'm wrong, I correct it. I have absolutely nothing to gain from being wrong. If that guy were proven absolutely right tomorrow, I wouldn't give a damn. I would correct my website. Right, right. I mean, and people yeah. believe that because I have the time. I don't really have the time, but because <laughs> I make the time to debunk conspiracies, mm-hmm. that I have something to gain from debunking them, like I'm going to call it a Christian, or I'm a government agent, or someone's paying me to do it. Those are the most common accusations that I get from people all over the internet. Okay, well, um, let me ask you this, Edward. So, basically what you're saying is that the uh, direct claims that were made in Zeitgeist for Christianity to Egyptian, you do not agree with them, and um, there's really no... Because I, I, I do... A lot of the stuff that I saw in Zeitgeist, I remember vaguely... Um, hearing Bill Mayer do them in Religious. A lot of the connections oh, that were made in Zeitgeist yeah, were made in Religious as well. Um, uh, of course, he got Horace wrong. It was um, God Ra. And, but um, that connection, you know, with Ra and, um, and so on and so forth, some of it was, uh, you know, it touched a little bit of truth. I, yeah, and that's what we got to be careful about, don't we, right? And it, it seems like it was <laughs> truth mixed in with fiction. Yeah. Um, you know, the only parts I can speak of are the parts that I've researched. I'm not going to speak about anything that I don't know anything about. So, but uh, what I'm asking you is that um, did you find any truth 
in uh, part one of Zeitgeist? Yeah, I believe, I, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, but I point out things that, yeah, that, you know, this is correct, this is correct. But the overwhelming majority of things, you know, connections they make are, you know, irrelevant or don't make sense or aren't true. Mm-hmm. Or, okay. You know, okay. or they misquote, they misquote the Bible. And, of course, I get, you know, a lot of people saying, why are you quoting the Bible unless you believe it? Well, if I'm using, or why are you using the Bible as a source? I get that question. That's probably the most often question I get. Why do you use the Bible as a source? Uh, well, because they're reading it? From the, why would I not use the Bible? <laughs> of course. What would I use as a source? <laughs> apparently, they just can't get their heads around that concept. Wow. Yeah, that makes sense. Of course you would. They're, they're reading it. Of course you'd use it. Right. Because, um, I mean, yeah, um, the connections they made with the story of Jesus being retold and retold throughout several religions, um, that I have researched to be true. He got the gods wrong of who, <laughs> when, when he referred to Egyptian, you know, but... Um, You're talking about just a recycled... Son of Son of God character, you mean being you right? Mean? The uh, the resurrections and okay. so on yeah, and so yeah, yeah, forth. Yeah, that, yeah, that not story. Jesus himself, but yeah, <laughs> right. The the whole you know the the story of Christ and a couple of similarities exist within um, more ancient religions than Christianity. Of course, I think, I think you talked about that. I think Edward talked about that a little bit. You know, it's like that, but it was just so not unique to Christianity. You know, right. the, and that's what yeah. I'm. That's what I like to know too. Is is the problem that they made the direct reference and said that Christianity stole from Egyptian, or is that the problem? Is they is that Zeitgeist is claiming that Christianity only stole from Egyptian well, and they didn't reference anything else? A lot, a lot of the claims made to say you know that Christians stole from the Egyptian are are correct, mm-hmm. or they are things that were you know exactly the same across the whole of Mesopotamia uh, right. and you know, beyond. For example, something being exactly the same in Egyptian, you know, the Egyptian faith or exactly the same in the Babylonian faith. Well, who's closer? The Babylonians. And, of course, that's who they took it from if they took it from anyone at all. Mm. Or they just didn't come up, with, come up with it on their own. I mean, it's not hard to sit down and mix things up, you right. know, hmm. come up with why, you know, the sun shines or whatever. <laughs> and... Especially if you come from a very similar culture as people around you, you're going to come to the sim- you know very similar conclusions, or you're just going to borrow it from them. Like, oh, that sounds good to me. Yeah. Right, right. Eight 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 five zero three zero eight zero two. You're listening to the Infidel Guy Show. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to type those in the chat room. We only have 20 minutes until the top of the hour and the end of the program. Yes, time is flying. Oh, sure. Again, the number is eight 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 five zero three zero eight zero two. Um, mm-hmm. I'd like to move on to nine uh, yeah. eleven truth, yes, so. mm-hmm. please. Yes, um, could you summarize for us what Zeitgeist is saying about the nine eleven uh, event? Well, it's pretty much the same thing as that was in the first movie, Loose Change. It's, it's the basic nine eleven conspiracy theory. Nothing too advanced, but the basic stuff that you know, I think all of us have heard that nine eleven was a you Inside know conspiracy. Job directly committed by the government or something they let happen. It doesn't really let on in the movie. Um, and it talks about the Pentagon and all those things like that. I mean, it's stuff that you can just go Google. I mean, <laughs> I mean I've mean, i done so much 9-11 stuff, I'm actually having a hard time remembering exactly what was in the movie. Oh, you know I understood. I have... yeah, we, we had to get, get to specifics. No problem. I think we have plenty of stuff to give you. That part of the movie... Was um, yeah, I would say the um, the hardest to stomach is truth because um, I will admit in part one and in part three he did commentary. He said he tried to make some A, B, and C connections, but that part two was nothing but soundbite. You know, it was a whole bunch of media clips. <laughs> Put the- I've, I've seen a lot of con- a lot of conspiracy theorists say that oh he just took it from loose change. I don't know where he got his stuff, but it wouldn't surprise me if he just took it from another. Uh, another section, another movie rather. Oh. Yeah. I didn't, you know, I didn't see what, not at, when the first time I watched it, I was like, what does this have to do with Christianity? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Yes, that that, is that, that was kind of my question. first thought too. And it was like, oh, great! Now we have, you know, I, I thought that that did a disservice to you know atheists everywhere because here we have an alleged someone who did some research, who's done some research on uh, the origins of religion, and uh, at least that's the illusion. 
and then we go into other crazy stuff. I was like, you must be kidding me. I was very disappointed. I was yeah. like, they could have left that out. Um, I don't know what it had to do with Christianity. Yeah. So, oh. <laughs> all right. So now we all know that the conspiracy people think that 9-11 was an inside job, um, much like some people say Pearl Harbor was and things of this nature. Right. He does um, go into that. He too. does go into in that. The, yeah. In now, um, now, on my Facebook page, I mentioned that you were going to be on the program tonight, Ed, and already we have people. We have Eric Harmon in the posting comments about the World Trade Center building number seven saying, mm-hmm. and you you know all the arguments. I'm sure you heard them all already, that there was evidence before the building collapsed that uh, I mean, this is all kind of weird stuff. And, and again, if Eric, if you're listening, if you want to call in for a moment, go ahead and call in if you want to. But it seems that we're kind of picking and choosing the data we want because we already have an inclination toward a particular side. And no, I'm, well, go I'm ahead. Sorry. I think an important issue here is, you know, they ignore things like, well, okay, we've been pretty much debunked on the, on the twin towers. So we'll talk about world trade center seven. That's all we'll talk about. Well, the point is of that is to prove that if we can prove that to someone that uh, the world trade center seven was, you know, blown up, for whatever reason, then automatically, even though they've been previously blocked, the other conspiracy theories become true. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's a way of sneaking in and trying to say, oh, well, look at World Trade Center 7. Does it matter if it was blown up on purpose? No. The fact is there was nobody inside of it when it did it, when it fell down in the first place. So, Interesting. And it, is, it all comes back to saying, well, you know, Larry huh. Silverstein made, you know, X billions of dollars, but the fact is he actually had to pay twice as much as he got back in insurance and fines and all kinds of different, you know, property problems. I have it all detail on my website. Um, and, you know, I don't really, two things that I don't talk about anymore on my website, really, I don't really go into 9-11 and I don't go into Zeitgeist because I'm so sick of both of them for the last two and a half years on mm-hmm. 9-11, 9-11, and Zeitgeist, Zeitgeist stuff. So I, I only talk about it when I have to. <laughs> I haven't even updated my 9-11 section. There's so many new right. things that have come out that are crazy that I haven't had. You know, that's a very I mean, good point. You know, you're right. I mean, I love what you said earlier, Edward. It makes a lot of sense. You're right. I mean, if the government planted these, if it was a controlled demolition by the government, which they believe the government planted, uh, planned all this anyway, they could have blown it up while people were in it to really make an impact. You're right. Well, blowing up an empty building, whoop de do. Um, and it's just so crazy. And then, the, and then the arguments people say, "Oh well, there was a warning that came down that the building was about to collapse." And this was long before the no, no, no. no he said uh, one argument is that the building there was a a radio announcement or something that the building collapsed when it really didn't. But then later it collapsed. Huh? Maybe they heard. Maybe someone said the building is about to collapse. Maybe this is like a gang a game of telephone. You know. Well, some, you know that. Go ahead. I love the example. My favorite example that they use is saying that, oh, on, you know, Channel 4, uh, English Channel 4, they showed that, they said that the building collapsed when it didn't collapse an hour before, so that proves it. Well, you know, there's mistakes in news, because I can go out and find video of, uh, you know, what is it, Jeff Goldblum. Uh, you can find announcements of Jeff Goldblum being dead. That's true. Before, and he wasn't dead. Does, I mean, does that mean the news is infallible, too, and... When he finally does die, that it's going to be mm. conspiracy by the news because they knew about it before it happened. Right. right. I mean, <clears throat> it's just a coincidence. I think maybe what happened was somebody said that they think World Trade Center 7 is going to collapse because two other buildings had collapsed and smashed into the side of it. And then, you know, that became, in, you know, the rush and confusion, it became, well, exactly. maybe it already did collapse. And so two different news sources, you know, claimed, they said, okay, well, I guess that's what happened. We'll report it before anyone else does. And this happens in the news all the time. You can find tons of evidence of people, you know, misreporting things or saying the wrong thing. That's true. Doesn't mean, I mean, these these are the same people who say the media lies to you, yet at the same time they'll say the news is absolutely <laughs> right all the time when it works in our favor. Oh, yeah, well, and no, doesn't and doesn't that sound familiar? You know, it's kind of like those creationists who reject most of the science when it when it contradicts what they have to say. Yeah, and they accept it when it when it agrees with their position. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that sounds very familiar, right? That's not being critical thinker. We got to look at all the evidence and, and weigh it objectively and be honest and exclude our own biases. That's the only way. Um, but I hear you about the nine one one thing, man. You, I've, I've debated people as aggressively as you know someone says. I can't actually. I can't think of anything worse. I mean, I've. I've, I've, I've talked to these conspiracy people and I've had ferocious debates with them 
more greater than I have with religious folks. Um, let me ask you about what they were saying about the uh, the claims inside guys that were made about the Pentagon's um, uh, crash or demise or however you want to put yeah. it. Mm-hmm. They said that um, you know there were no shards or no evidence of the plane going into the Pentagon. It looked like it had been done by some type of vehicle, <laughs> um, and there's no. You know, oh, the, the government is claiming that it was hit by a plane, but there is no evidence whatsoever except for very small shards that you can pick up with your hand. Have you found any evidence uh, corroborating or contradicting that in your search? Well, actually, you know, let me a little, go, move a little back here. When I first heard about the 9-11 conspiracy theories, not long after 9-11, I actually thought it was pretty compelling. And it was only after looking into it a lot that I realized, you know, a lot of the connections made are kind of, you know, iffy at best. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to things like that, I mean, you can go out and find tons of pictures on the Internet of, you know, pieces of plane everywhere. That's right. You can find witnesses who saw the plane. You can find uh, all of things like that. Of course, you can always say, well, they dropped the pieces on the, you know, they dropped the pieces (laughs) of the plane out there, and uh, they pay off the witnesses. Government plans. That is too far that approaches the realm of infallibility. Like when people say, well, God can do it, so he can, and that's why he put dinosaur bones everywhere. <laughs> that's the same kind of thing to me. I mean, you know, science relies on being potentially falsifiable. If you can't have any kind of what ifs and you're always right, then you are religion. Mm. You're faith-based. You're not wow. scientifically based. Right on. Very, very good analogy. That's right. And you're right about that. I'm glad you mentioned that. If, if people, it's kind of like the, the Google search, as you mentioned. If people want to search for it, they'll find it. I know I do that. I might get an email. It might be something that sounds really interesting, but a lot of the times I'll search for that keyword of something that is supposed to have happened, and I type in myth or or something after it, you know, or you know, fact, fiction, whatever, and amazingly you'll find varied results about whatever this thing is that's supposed to be true. And I wish more people would do that. And one good site I want to recommend here is also Snopes.com. Yeah, you mentioned that earlier. Oh, yeah. No. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, you did. Okay, so many of my family members I have, I've had to send to Snopes and UrbanLegends.com because they believe in the most silliest things. If they just would learn how to use a search engine, they'd find, they'd see the pictures of the fuselage, <laughs> you know, they, 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 or they, they'd read about the, 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 the I think you mentioned that the, it was like a bus or something crashed into it, and that's, that was really the fuselage, mm-hmm. or one of the fuselages of the plane, you know, crashing into the. Uh... But anyway, but okay. it's, it's, go ahead. I got some more stuff out. Yeah, because um, gosh, there's not enough time to. I, I want to get to part three too, because some of the stuff they mentioned about you know us going to the wars and how they were car- cars were very interesting. But um, I want to ask one more question about part two. Um, they had a clip of Bush at a press conference and um, a reporter asked him why wouldn't him and Cheney meet at the uh, with the 9-11 commission um, se- uh, separately as the commission had asked rather than together and in the clip Bush sidestepped that question uh, are you, you uh, do you remember what I'm referring to are here? you familiar with that yeah I know what you're I know what you're talking about you know when I saw that original uh, on television, I actually thought at the time, is Bush really think he's stupid and can't you know talk on his own? <laughs> and really, I, that was the point. I think there was a whole lot of incompetence that happened before and on 9-11. And I think the Bush administration really was just trying to cover their ass. And I think that has you wow. know caused more you know conspiracy-mindedness than anything else. Good yeah, point. They contributed they might, to it. That they good did. point because they, because because they might have been trying to cover up some stuff because right they wanted like you said they, they wanted to cover their own asses so it's possible they might have tried to do some cover ups. Yeah, that uh, <laughs> funny episode of South Park when um they, it was all this convoluted uh, these actions and um they were saying the government you know um did nine eleven and come and at the end Bush uh shot somebody and he was like yeah we did contribute nine eleven all the conspiracy theories that are, are out there we put them out there to make you think we didn't do it but we really did <laughs> it was so crazy <laughs> that's <is> funny <laughs> wow so yeah the whole interview thing you you um you think that was due to uh incompetence um Bush not being yeah. able to okay <laughs> Like, also, you know, other than the fact that I was raised in an atheist household, as already discussed, um, 
I was also raised in an anarchist household. I mean, my parents are both uh, anarcho syndicalists, and so I was always given a huge mistrust of the state. So that's why at first when I heard about the 9 11 stuff, I was like, well, it would seem possible. I mean, the state's right. capable of anything. Right. And I knew, you know, growing up, I was always talking about things like, you know, Cointel Pro and the Black Panther Party and all that stuff. I mean, I grew up on that. So I knew the potential of government to do evil things. And mm. so, you know, that's why I was so willing at first to say, to consider it. And then the more I looked into it, I just, you know, it's not true. I mean, not at least not in the way, you know, they lay it out. It's definitely not. Okay. Hmm. All right. Well, I guess, and, and lastly, we only have six minutes. Uh, the Fed. Um, yes, get into part three. <laughs> that was rather interesting as well. It's like it, 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 it's so interesting that you almost want some of this stuff to be true because of the implications, because of what it would mean for our country. And, you know, but, hey, like you said before, truth is truth and fiction is fiction. And sometimes it's not hard to debunk if you just look for the real evidence. And, and what is what what is a part three talking about? Uh, Edward. So the primary part of part three is that, you know, the Federal Reserve puts people in debt by creating a perpetual money supply out of nothing, and that the income tax was created so that they could pay off the non you know, the debt that came out of nothing with money that apparently came out of nothing too, and basically keep people enslaved because you know, they're enslaved to debt. I mean that's basically the whole point. I mean it talks a little bit about, you know, Vietnam, World War Two and things like that, but that is the primary the majority of focus of part three. Right, and and the reason they talk about these wars is because they tie it in to money funding the wars. They're saying we, we make money off these wars, wars, so that's why they were um, coerced and provoked and started so that we could yeah, that's a very make common the rich claim. richer. Mm-hmm. Um, so what have you found debunking um, some of this stuff in Part 3? Well, I knew about a lot of the things presented in Part 3 because I had, you know, I was familiar with Alex Jones, another conspiracy theorist, his work. Mm. And a lot of the things what is in Zeitgeist actually originate from two places. Uh, that is, the stuff about the Federal Reserve, things about income tax, and the things about one world government. Mm-hmm. All Those originate from two primary places. One is far-right militia movements in the 80s and 90s. And the other are evangelical Christians who think the Antichrist is going to come and create a one-world government, one currency, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And those are the two primary places these things come from. And you can find that – you can find 20 years ago, you can find these people talking about – or, you know, 25 years ago from the John Birch Society, they're saying there's going to be one-world government. They're doing it right now. Well, that was 25 years ago, and they're still saying today it's coming right now. Just like and Jesus is coming, coming. <laughs> basically. <laughs> In Here the comes, day. I'm sorry. No, go well, ahead. I, it's the same thing they've been saying for a long time. And the, a lot of it originates, you know, going back even further in the 1960s and 70s, is from the rise of the neoconservative movement, the rise of uh, evangelical Christianity again in the United States. Prior to that, you didn't have fear really of all these goofy little things. Uh, Back when the Federal Reserve Act was passed, a lot of the conspiracy theorists claimed that only three people or whatever voted for it. The fact is the majority of Congress was there. The majority of people did vote for it. It passed. And mm. um, <laughs> later on, uh, two of the people that are talked about the most are Congressman Lewis McFadden and also Congress uh, Charles Lindbergh, not the pilot. <laughs> and... Uh, both of them tried to establish a a uh, impeachment of the people who started the Federal Reserve Act because they believed that the Federal Reserve was a Jewish international conspiracy to undermine the integrity of the United States. And this is all where the Federal Reserve starts. It started with anti-Semitism. Hmm. Of course, now I wouldn't say that you know people oppose the Federal Reserve are anti-Semites. They're not. But they don't realize where this originally comes from. Uh, and it was, and there was a vote in the Congress to impeach um, Woodrow Wilson and you know various congressmen. And out of the it was like 408 people that were in Congress, eight people voted yes with Lewis McFadden and Congressman Lumberg. That's how much people thought they were crazy. Hmm. Okay. I think Ron Paul gets better votes than that in the Congress with his <laughs> unpopular ideas. Um, 
And it's essentially it's come from there, this, this huge fear of central banks and these conspiracies to do with the Rothschilds and all this stuff. You can find it all going way back when. It's really fear of banking in general uh, from regular people that's created a lot of these conspiracy theories. And, you know, I don't trust banks either. Like I said, kind of household I grew up in and the kind of person I am now, you know, I don't trust banks at all. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't trust, uh, typically don't trust rich people in general. But the thing is, that doesn't mean it's okay to make things up or to misrepresent or to say that the money comes from nothing. And it doesn't really. It's all is based on, if you want a physical thing to base it on, it's really based on nothing. But the <laughs> monetary concepts and things behind it, I mean, it's a long, drawn-out thing. I explain it in the my review of Zeitgeist Part 3 and in the uh, second movie, Zeitgeist Addendum, I talk about it in the first part of that um it's you know way too much to explain here how it actually works but it's mm-hmm. needlessly complicated and i can understand the desire to want something easier and something you can trust i also understand the desire to not want the federal reserve to be you know somewhat private because you know why would you trust the private industry to do what's in your best interest but at the same time that doesn't mean they're actually up to evil i think right. a lot of it has to do with the kind of people we elect to office, you know, you elect Ronald Reagan and you want you want neoclassical liberalism, well, you're going to get some of that. Mm-hmm. And, of course, when it fails, uh, who do you blame? You don't blame the person you elected. You you blame, you know, these other people. It must be some kind of conspiracy. We never vote wrong. Mm-hmm. Things like that. <laughs> okay. Um, last question. Lastly, I, I, I want to ask you one about one of the last claims they made about the, I think it was RFID chip. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Because um, I, I do remember back in undergrad, they were, um, we had some a couple of discussions about this, the real ID, and how it's going to be implemented, and, um, you know, it, it's going to be required for everyone to get this ID card. And when this, they brought this RFID, you know, I was like, hold on. Are six, you six, really? Six, huh? Yeah. You know, Mark of the Beast, baby. I hope this isn't connected. So <laughs> tell me what you know about this. RFID chip, if it even exists. Oh, the RFID chip does exist. I mean, we use them on dogs and things like that, just in case they get lost. But uh, this is one of the things that comes from evangelical Christianity, that they're going to chip us in order to buy and sell things, you know, the whole end times thing. Mm. Credit card. This is where this originates. And I never understood, though, why they're afraid of a national ID card, a standard ID card. It doesn't really bother me in the whole sense of, you know, the whole state in any way. I mean, in other countries, you know, in almost all European countries, you know, there's a standard ID card that everyone has. It, you know, kind of like a driver's license. With it. And basically the whole point, of the, you know, as far as I understand it, with the real ID and the national ID card was to have a national standard that would work everywhere because everything right now is different for every single state. True. And... That's what they wanted to establish, and of course it never happened. And and even in the zeitgeist, they said, "Well, it'll start by May 2008." Well, that's you know, come and gone. long past, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and of course a all lot right, of people. It, Go ahead. The fear of it, the fear of it. If you look back, where it all comes from, John Burke Society is from, and Pat uh, Pat Robertson from the 700 Club. Mm-hmm. You can find all fear of you know the one world government the you know a chip in your or a, some kind of tattoo on your hand or on your forehead so that the antichrist can make you buy and sell within his you know one world currency and all this stuff and I, that's what astonished me is that so many of the zeitgeist people claim to be you know against christianity or non-christians yet they bought into uh, most of the, the second half of part three which is pretty much like reading from the book of revelation Mm. as far as the evangelical interpretation goes today. Right. You know, I, I think a lot of uh, comparisons to Hitler comes up quite often, too, when we talk about this chip, you know. Uh, you, you well, just, you know... The, the, the ever-menacing Papelenbitter, you know, like where are your papers, you know. Um, I think people are a little bit concerned about that, kind of track me everywhere you go kind of thing. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the thing I always bring up is, you know, Hitler and Stalin did not need a chip or anything else to find you and kill you. They did it anyway. The wow. state doesn't need this ability that they want to, that they claim the state wants to give people. Right. Why give it? 
I mean, the, the main point is why do it? And they say for control. For control of what? I mean, for example, like I brought up earlier, the coin Telpro, you know, you know, killing off you know, some Black Panther people, you know, arresting them. Why did they do that? Well, because they considered them a threat, because, you know, not only because they were black, but also because they were communists. Those two different things, you know, were a conceivable threat to them. So mm-hmm. what the hell could the average person have a threat to the state that would warrant them wanting to track them everywhere? Plus, I came up with a while back, and I've been meaning to publish it, um, a, I wrote a long, drawn-out essay about what it would take to literally chip and track the move of every single person on the planet. Like, if you wanted to do that, how much investment would it take, how much networking would it take, the infrastructure, the establishment, blah, 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 blah. And if they're doing this behind the scenes, you know, it would take thousands of IT people, thousands of specialists, tons of money. Sure. And you can't tell me that all of them are paid off and all of them are quiet about it. That's too convenient because if they can't keep Watergate quiet, they're not going to keep, keep, you know, tracking every human being on the face of the planet quiet for very long. Well, you know, that's why we use aliens. But all right. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yes, that's where V comes in. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but, oh, man, we could have you on for much longer. Edward Winston, thank you so much for appearing on the program with thank us tonight. You. And uh, we will be checking out your website, conspiracyscience.com. Ladies and gentlemen, take it out, check it out tonight. Uh, too bad we didn't get any calls tonight, but that's okay. Um, I think people just enjoy listening. Okay. Um, okay. Well, uh, Excellent. What you got? Is, sure. I, uh, I joined your forum, so... I'll be able to talk on there. Plus, we also have a Facebook group for anyone on Facebook. Just, you know, Facebook search Conspiracy Science and you can find us. Okay, excellent. I think we're going to have a forum started there in a moment as well, too, so we can, people can follow up on the show yes. we just did tonight. All right, well, have a great right, night. Well, I'll and, okay, I'll see you there. Okay, have All a right. great night. All right, bye-bye. Bye. See you later. All right, um, we don't know what's coming up next week, ladies and gentlemen, but stay tuned to InfidelGuy.com. If you're not already, join add me on Facebook add me on MySpace, just look for Infidel Guy or Reginald Finley, and anywhere else on the web mm-hmm. um, if, don't trust those are impersonators on those other sites you know, that's not really me Okay, I, you know, that, that with the um, whipped cream or your nipples <laughs> yeah, the whipped cream, yeah, that's, the... trust me that's really somebody else, just, alright but no, uh, thanks everybody for listening uh, we're going to have this show, we can do a little bit of editing uh, but we're going to have this show up available for you in the archives on YouTube Maybe. And, of course, we're gold members. And talk to you later. In In reason. reason.